Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, The Evolution of Early Research and Collaboration in 2020, a Stakeholder Roundtable. My name is Louise Russell and I'm going to be moderating the session today. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items. So you've all joined in listen-only mode, however you will have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing your questions into the chat page of the control panel. We want to encourage you to send in your questions at any time during the presentations. We'll collect these and address them during the QA session at the end. But if we're unable to get through all of the questions during the session, we'll include them in a Q&A document that we'll send out up with the recording after the webinar itself. Should you experience any technical difficulties, please add this to the chat box and a member of the organising team will help. In the unlikely event we experience any technical issues, we'll message the audience and restart the webinar. So that's the end of the housekeeping notes. I'm just going to kick off with a few introductory comments before we hear from our panel of case studies. So obviously 2020 has been an extremely unusual year, to put it very mildly, and the pandemic has accelerated activity within the early research space with huge increases in preprints and new forms of collaboration emerging. And while various communities have been embracing the merits of open early research for some time, the volume of activity in this area during the past year has really highlighted the benefits, the opportunities, and also the challenges associated with sharing early research. But also the processes, infrastructure and communities, publishing preferences are evolving and adapting as a result of this. So with all of this in mind, we felt it would be timing during OA week to bring together a range of stakeholders and perspectives within scholarly communications to discuss how open early research and collaboration is evolving, how this varies between communities and disciplines, and also discuss what the future might hold. So the session will focus on five case studies. We'll hear from our five presenters in the first half of the session. And then the second half of the session will be dedicated to questions and further discussion. So really please do add your questions to the chat box as we go through. So I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Alex Wade, who is Technical Program Manager for Open Science at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. I'll just transfer over to Alex. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody, at least morning for me. I'm on the, the west coast of the US, uh, so I had to get up early this morning, so pardon me if I'm drinking my coffee during this. Um, <laughs> I am, yes, I'm with the uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative uh, based in California, and um, go ahead and go on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> we have a, a sort of very uh, ambitious goals within the initiative, uh, at least from within the science initiative portion of CZI, to support the science and technology that will make it possible possible to cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of the century. Uh, that's 80 years from now, uh, and so we're really uh, only uh, almost four years old at the moment. Um, but one of the things that evolved early on in our in our discussions of how we're going to actually tackle this problem really sort of centers around uh, open science and changing the culture of, of the way that science gets done. Uh, so we are an unusual philanthropic organization in that we uh, we actually have a technology arm and an advocacy component as well. So uh, about a year and a half ago, we actually formulated an open science program within the science funding program. Uh, go ahead and go on to the next slide. Uh, and across, sorry, <clears throat> next slide, please. And across all of the programs, we are, there's a slight delay here, at least I'm not seeing the, ne the next slide. Neil? <laughs> Uh, across all of the programs, what we try to do is sort of look at this through a, a multi-pronged approach and not simply be a, a funder, uh, but finding ways that we can actually uh, collaborate in finding new solutions, engaging with the community uh, uh, partially so that we can learn more. Um, and, and one of the other unusual aspects about us as a philanthropic organization is that we actually have an entire technology arm associated with us. So what I want to do very quickly in these slides is give you, uh, looking through the lens of preprints, uh, give an example of, of how we're engaging in each one of these aspects. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of uh, funding, I'll talk a little bit about some of the platforms that we are, are supporting right now around preprints. Um, in building, I'll talk uh, briefly about a, a discovery platform called Meta and how preprints are starting to take on a, a little bit more of, a, of an increased visibility within that platform. How we've been engaging with preprint ecosystem to see how we might take advantage of some of the uh, unique affordances that it has. Uh, and then give an example of one of the collaborative projects that we've been working on this year around some of the COVID-19 literature. This is not everything that we're doing in the open science program. This is all just sort of looking at it through the lens of preprints and, and early sharing of research outputs. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, there are two preprint services currently hosted out of Cold Spring Harbor Labs in New York. Uh, one of them that's been around uh, for a number of years since I think about 2013 is BioArchive. Uh, just in this last week, they surpassed the uh, 100,000th preprint hosted on BioArchive. Uh, and then uh, last year, year and a half ago, I believe, um, they started up a new a uh, parallel service called MedArchive really focused more on the uh, clinical research that's coming out. And each one of these had a slightly different uh, different audience on the one hand, but then also different requirements for um, how they actually run these through a, a cursory um, review uh, before them. So different audiences, different review processes prior to posting. And we're currently at CZI uh, supporting both of these services uh, hosted by Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, go on to the next slide. One of the things that uh, you may have seen uh, specifically within the biosciences is that uh, the, the graph here on the left is, is really up through the beginning of the year, uh, but, but preprints within the biosciences are really starting to have this hockey stick moment where they are uh, more accepted uh, both by the researchers and, and also by the journals uh, accepting uh, submissions that have previously been published or simultaneously being published as preprints. This graph doesn't even uh, get into the coronavirus, uh, but you'll you will see as we update these charts that uh, preprints have been e extremely useful in rapid sharing, both in terms of the uh, the biomedical research as well as in the clinical research that, that's been going on this year. And my colleague Dario Tarabarelli uh, published this this piece here in Fast Company uh, that I invite you to check out. Really, sort of talking about. Um, how the availability of preprints in biosciences have been crucial um, uh, in, in, in understanding uh, very quickly the, the learnings that are coming out as part of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Go on to the next slide. So I, I mentioned we also, sorry, next slide again. I apologize, I have a build slide here, just one. Um, we, we have a build component, a technology component within CZI. And so we have a discovery service called Meta, uh, which is designed to allow you to either consume existing feeds or create your own feeds of, of content, um, largely, uh, originally largely uh, published biomedical content, but over the past year we've been adding uh, increasingly more preprint services into it. Uh, go into the next slide. So just to give you a flavor of this, uh, this is what it would look like if I've got a feed on the literature around cerebral organoids. Um, this feed is constantly being updated as new preprints or published papers are, are available to us. Um, so the, the basic user interface is that you come in and you're seeing an updated feed of, of new content here. Go ahead and hit next for me, Neil. Um, but one of the things that you'll see here is that there's a filter down by paper types. So whether or not you're looking for review articles or opinion articles. And if I click that one more time, if I filter that down, you'll, uh, you'll see that now I filtered the list down to just the preprints and kind of hard to read in this screenshot, but the first one is from Research Square, the second one is from BioArchive. Uh, we have uh, preprints.org, archive.org, medarchive, uh, and chemarchive also indexed within the, the site as well. So we're starting to lead together the, the preprint literature uh, alongside the published literature to increase discoverability here. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, and then also in, in terms of engaging with the preprint ecosystem, we've been partnering with ASAP Bio, also on this call, uh, to, to really sort of understand what the, as I said before, those unique affordances are. And so we had a, hosted a meeting 
a, almost a year ago in San Francisco to look at the possibility of additional services that could be built alongside or atop the preprint ecosystem. And this is an area that we're starting to uh, to invest more in right now and sort of this notion of uh, overlay services for preprints so that we can improve the quality of them over time. Uh, if you want to read the report, there's a, a link in there and I assume these slides will be made available later. And next slide, my last slide here. Uh, one of the things that we uh, have also done this year in, in partnering with others is that in response to a White House OSTP call, we partnered with Google, Microsoft, and the Semantic Scholar folks at Allen AI uh, to start to make available a machine readable corpus of the, not only the COVID-19, but all of the, the coronavirus family uh, literature and it was crucial for us to, in the same vein as making the preprints available in a service like Meta, to also feed the uh, bioarchive and MedArchive. Uh, now we've added uh, archive.org preprints as well into this data set. And this is something that um, we started uh, releasing in uh, March of this year. Uh, we're doing daily releases of this now. And as of last week, there were roughly uh, 300,000 papers represented in this machine readable corpus and about, it actually needs to be updated, about 120,000 of them now are full text. Uh, so that's that's me, that's uh, CZI and that's uh, preprints from our, our perspective. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alex. Moving on to our next case study, our next speaker is Jessica Polka, who's Executive Director at ASAP Bio. Thank you so much. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, as you have already heard a little bit from Alex, um, ASAP Bio is a nonprofit organization interested in uh, generating and sparking cultural change in the life sciences regarding the use of preprints and open peer review. And we do this through convenings and through running working groups and events. And I'll tell you about a little bit of what we do uh, in the coming slides. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, as Alex has already mentioned, there has been a huge growth in preprints over the last uh, few months. Next slide. Um, which has been uh, kind of uh, aided by friendly policies and integration of preprints into uh, the research infrastructure. For example, next slide. Not only their uh, appearance in Crossref, but also now the inclusion of preprints uh, from selected authors and on selected topics in PubMed, uh, and the full text of preprints being made available on European C as well. Next slide. However, uh, even though this growth is impressive, it is not even uh, across the entire world. So this image on the left is a chart from Rich Abdel's work uh, categorizing the uh, by country representation of usage of uh, bioarchive compared to the overall publication output. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that there's many ways of interpreting this, but clearly some countries like the United States and the UK are overrepresented while others are underrepresented. Um, so Ross Mouth actually at an ASAP Bio event yesterday um, you know, highlighted the fact that there are other country specific servers that cater to different languages uh, and that I think are, are um, you know, possibly not providing the entire picture by looking only at English language preprints. Um, but the point remains that there are, there are some, there's a divide uh, geographically in the way that the preprint servers that we commonly think of, uh, at least in uh, the biomedical sciences in the United States uh, are used. And furthermore, um, preprint servers are, you know, I think that there's been some, you know, questions over the fact that uh, there may be a differential in who feels comfortable putting their work out early. Uh, we recently ran a survey, the results are not uh, in the slide deck, but um, you know, and found that both early and senior researchers are concerned <laughs> about the same degree about the possibilities of scooping. Uh, and so, you know, it's 
it's not clear to me that there's necessarily career stage uh, differences. Um, but there are other disparities that carry through, at least from other elements of publishing. So for example, on the right in this slide, you can see that during the pandemic, the uh, representation of female first authors has declined in some servers, but not in others. Next slide, please. Uh, so what is ASAP Bio doing to try to ensure that preprinting is accessible um, to all communities? We have a program called ASAP Bio Fellows, which is a kind of structured six month program where individuals who are often but not always researchers uh, enter into a cohort where they are receive some education about preprints, uh, practice advocating and organizing events. So for example, uh, the fellows just organized a panel uh, yesterday um, and are also you know, looking at creating infographics and other resources. And the goal here is really to, from uh, diverse geographical uh, areas and from different fields to provide um, a way to uh, support champions of catalyzing change um, within their own communities. Next slide. Um, the, I think the, the second opportunity that preprints present is not only to provide a way for people to share research results um, at a time when they feel ready to do so, but also to enable open review of those results. So um, I just put here an example preprint that shows a few of the different uh, ways that review is, is exercised on preprint. So for example, this paper has a pre-light, which is a uh, fantastic highlight uh, written usually by early career authors at uh, uh, the company Biologists. There's uh, tweets that are linked in, and there's oftentimes some very rich material in the comments section. Next slide. But uh, this is not the only way that uh, commenting appears on preprints. Um, there are a variety of initiatives that are trying to encourage uh, peer review on preprints and other research outputs by providing innovative features. Um, enabling uh, individuals to communicate with one another in a journal club style, uh, for example, like pre-review, um, providing optional anonymity, enabling structured review so that it's very easy to kind of provide a multiple choice assessment of a paper, for example, plot it, um, and uh, open science rapid pre-review. We catalog some of these in a registry. Next slide. Uh, and we're also very interested in the really fundamental question, uh, which is that I think everyone can recognize the value of feedback on preprints to authors, to readers, to, to journal editors, uh, and to the media that now is increasingly looking at, especially COVID-19 preprints. Uh, but we are, uh, I think the kind of challenge is how do we encourage thoughtful review on preprints? Certainly, uh, researchers are very much um, uh, you know, overtaxed, but at the same time, um, devoting energy to peer review is a really valuable uh, service to the community. So we are organizing in collaboration with a variety of partners, um, including Chan Zuckerberg, a design sprint um, at, on November 13th and December 3rd, where we are looking for ideas of how to encourage additional feedback, curation, and peer review on preprints. And we are hoping to receive proposals, even from people who are just brainstorming and developing these ideas, but also registrations from individuals who just want to participate and provide feedback to help the participants hone their ideas. Uh, so I would definitely encourage anyone interested to. Um, to sign up. Next slide. And with that, I think I just want to thank uh, my colleagues and our funders uh, for their support. I'm looking forward to the rest of the panel and the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jessica. 
Moving on to the next case study, um, our next speaker is Professor Mareka Brunning, who's Professor of Political Science at the University of North Texas. So we'll just... Oh, apologies. I have two extra slides in here uh, that I think you need to <laughs> Did you want to add any additional comments there, Jessica, before we move on? Uh, no, no, no. Apologies. These are optional slides. So, uh, yeah, please feel free to skip past them. Sure, thanks. Okay, so I think if we go to the next slide, we should be ready for Professor Brunning. So yeah, thank you. thank you, thank you. So uh, I'll be providing a slightly different perspective um, as an author who posted uh, a paper to uh, the preprint uh, server offered by the American Political Science Association. It's known as APSA preprints. Um, so um, on the first slide, actually, I have my own name. I also listed the co-authors um, that I have on the paper, just to you know, to make sure I recognize them as well. Uh, so Christina Fattori, Jennifer Ramos, and, and uh, Jamie Scalera are my co-authors on the paper that we posted uh, to preprints. Next slide, please. Um, so question is, why did we choose, um, you know, APSA preprints to post our paper um, in political science? This is actually still quite a new thing. Uh, pre -print, APSA preprints has been around for a little bit, um, not awfully long. Um, so we see a number of papers already posted there, but uh, there's still quite a few people uh, who, you know, haven't made use of the server and uh, we are, you know, my co-authors and I were similarly, um, you know, had not yet used it until we posted this paper and we posted that in, in the early fall. Um, part of the reason that we wanted to post this paper is that um, it deals with um, the reactions and responses to the pandemic, the experience of the pandemic by uh, political scientists. And um, so this is uh, based on a survey that we conducted in May. Um, and uh, because of the, the currency of the topic, and we thought there would be you know, quite a lot of interest for people wanting to know whether their experiences fit you know, what our respondents were saying and, and so on, uh, we um, wanted to make this paper uh, broadly accessible. And we thought EPSA preprints would uh, offer us that. Um, we also, you know, we sort of toyed around with the idea, but then actually did it after uh, one of the co-authors had a chance to do a blog post with uh, International Affairs, with which uh, a journal in our discipline. Um, they have a, a blog through uh, Medium. And, um, you know, as a result of the publicity we got through that, we were uh, thinking we really should make this paper much more broadly accessible. And so that's when we jumped to EPSA preprints, posted the paper there uh, to, to create that access. Next slide, please. Um, so the benefits of using uh, preprints for us were that we did indeed um, get quick dissemination of the paper out of that. And, you know, we suspected for timely content that's especially important that there's a greater incentive uh, to, uh, to post it uh, to preprints. It's actually, you know, evidenced by the fact that that was the first time we used it. And um, we, you know, we would not necessarily have done that uh, with other papers. Uh, basically out of habit, right? So changing the habit of, of actually using the preprint server uh, was something that we did because of the topic uh, that, that we were addressing in the paper. Um, so one of the things that we had access to previously is the paper archives that uh, professional associations would run, uh, usually in association with their annual conferences. Uh, but the papers that you post there are usually only accessible to the other conference attendees and, um, you know, certainly only to the members of the society. So creating that broader access, I think, is one of the things that makes preprints really attractive. And now that I've used it and my co-authors would feel the same way, uh, we might be, you know, more interested in, in uh, using it again for, uh, for other work that we're doing. Uh, because uh, the accessibility, I think, is demonstrated by the data, as you'll see on the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so this is what uh, the preprint look like um, on uh, on the screen. It's um, you know I just took a screenshot 
And the numbers that you see, the metrics to the right, they provide the alt metrics donut and also the just straight number of views and the number of downloads. And of course, you know, views are always going to be bigger than downloads. Um, but at this point, uh, we have over 900 downloads and about 235 um, uh, or no views, the ni plus 900 views and uh, over 230 actual downloads for people that seem to be interested enough in the paper to, uh, to actually want to download and read it. Um, so next slide, please. All right, the accessibility um, that we got through PayPins has led to additional publicity. And so that's exactly the, the kind of thing we hope to get um, out of uh, the publicity or posting it through preprints uh, for this particular paper. Um, so we were mentioned on uh, Political Science Now, which is actually within the association, um, you know, uh, news uh, kind of feature uh, that reaches to the membership of the association. And uh, we suspect that that has led to additional views and downloads uh, we also netted some exposure via Twitter, and then as a result of having this on APSA preprints, um, the university, my university, uh, did a press release on the paper as well. So, you know, each of these um, add little bits of exposure uh, to the paper. Um, so the quick dissemination that we were looking for is exactly what, you know, what we were able to do. Um, given the timeliness of the topic, we thought that that was really something that, that was important. And uh, with that, it, it, um, you, it was a helpful complement uh, to uh, journal publishing, which has, you know, generally been sort of how um, as academics, we get rewarded, right? That's, you know, that's what we ultimately need to do is to, you know, to publish uh, our papers in academic journals. And uh, the review process there, you know, just takes a long time, uh, you know, usually a minimum of three months for that to turn around, and that's usually on a good day. And then the publication process subsequent to an acceptance, which doesn't necessarily come after the first round of your review, um, you know, that takes another number of months. So the, the, the delays that you incur with that really make a feature like, uh, like a preprint server very attractive. Now, the one thing that we, uh, that was highlighted by the previous speakers and that really is something we haven't seen at this point is, you know, the ability to have sort of uh, public comment and public review um, of the paper. So we got accessibility, we got dissemination, uh, of the paper uh, through using uh, apps or preprints. Uh, but uh, the comment section on the paper is at this point still blank, right? There is There, there haven't been comments. This may be part of the, the fact that for political science, uh, preprints is still a relatively new thing. Uh, so people aren't keyed into using this um, for uh, open peer review, uh, for providing feedback to, to authors. Uh, that can help them improve the paper. And uh, I think that's a feature that I would love to see um, augmented or in other ways uh, advocated for that, uh, that it actually does get used. Because I think especially uh, right now with a lesser ability of people to uh, meet face to face and um, these sort of electronic means of communication um, become probably more important to, uh, to actually get feedback on your work um, to uh, to be able to improve it and then eventually um, have it published. Um, I actually checked uh, to see whether our paper was unusual in not having comments and uh, all the papers both on uh, COVID and papers that were on, on people's more, um, you know, substantive work. Uh, the ones that I checked, none of them had comments. And so I think this may be something that um, as a discipline we need to work on uh, to make sure that um, you know that that aspect of preprints also uh, gets to be used uh, certainly in in our discipline um, next slide please and i think my next slide is essentially my thank you slide and i look forward to to comments Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Brunning.
Moving on to our next case study, our next speaker is Anne Donlan, who's Project Manager of Digital Initiatives at MLA Commons. Commons sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk about collaboration and early research on MLA Commons, which is an online platform created by the Modern Language Association. And MLA Commons is motivated by an interest in creating space for scholars to publicly share and communicate about a wide range of scholarship. Um, it was created as a space for scholars to communicate and collaborate with one another. Um, and the network expanded to include an open access repository. And around that same time, we launched a federation of networks under the umbrella of Humanities Commons um, to foster interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, next slide, please. So MLA Commons is motivated by an interest in creating space for scholars to publicly share and communicate about a wide range of scholarship. Um, it launched in January 2013 with support from Mellon. Um, and on MLA Commons from the beginning, members could create public profiles, join groups, and, cre and create WordPress sites. Uh, next slide. There were a number of motivating factors, including fostering collaboration and discussion, um, as well as providing an, an environment in which to experiment with new models of scholarly communication. Um, and it's also been important for us to use and contribute to open source scholar-led and community-owned infrastructure. So the Commons is built upon open source software created by a team at the City University of New York's Graduate Center called Commons in a Box. Um, and within a couple of years of launching MLA Commons, an open access repository became part of the platform. Um, and the development of that repository was also informed by such values of collaboration and experimentation. Uh, next slide, please. So the core, the Commons Open Repository Exchange, is an open access repository that was created in collaboration with Columbia University Libraries um, and supported by the NEH. The NEH. Um, if you could move two slides ahead, please. Um, the development of the Commons has taken place alongside a larger disciplinary conversation about how to recognize a wider range of scholarly activity. So moving beyond sort of traditional forms like uh, journal articles and books to thinking about how digital humanities, publicly engaged scholarship, experimental forms of scholarship, um, and teaching and pedagogy of scholarship can be recognized and sort of counted um, in academic hiring and job decisions, things like that. Um, and as such, the design of the core repository includes a wide range of um, types of items. Um, and you can see some of those here, um, including things like syllabi, blog posts, video essays, and more. Uh, next slide, please. The design of the repository also supports scholars who want to work in public sharing early versions of work. Um, in the humanities, um, as we were hearing with political science similarly, preprints are less known and less adopted, um, though we do see scholars sharing preprints in the humanities, especially in certain subfields um, like related to digital humanities and among scholars who are engaged with libraries and open access conversations. Um, but more often, sharing of early research in the humanities takes place at conferences and posts on personal websites, um, social media. And so by encouraging the sharing of such work in core, like conference papers um, and blog posts, CORE allows for scholars to make early research accessible and discoverable with structured metadata, DOIs, and a promise of long-term preservation, um, as well as indexing by a range of services. Uh, next slide, please. Um, because the repository is incorporated with the social elements of the commons, like groups, um, work can find readers with group notifications um, and collections of materials being uh, built within groups. Next slide. Um, and then the Commons has also provided a space where scholars um, and the MLA can experiment with forms and processes of scholarly communication. So for example, um, the open access peer reviewed digital pedagogy in the humanities uh, takes a much more capacious form than a print project would allow. It, allows for, it also allows for readers to create their own collections from the materials published in the project. 
Um, and one of the values of publishing work in this way was evident this spring as campuses moved to teach remotely, we were able to make a preview version of the site of this project available um, before the final proofing and bug testing had been completed. Uh, next slide, please. We've also seen a number of open peer review processes hosted on the commons, um, including the open peer review of the digital pedagogy and the humanities uh, project. You can see a screenshot of the peer review site there. Uh, next slide. And so future directions. In the future, we'd like to um, more directly facilitate discussions around core deposits, um, which might allow for open a review using the repository directly. Um, as more events are taking place remotely, we want to find better ways to facilitate feedback on work in progress, like conference papers. Um, we'll continue to be thinking about education around authors' rights and sharing preprints and published works for our members. Um, and also, Humanities Commons is growing. It's, um, the hosting is moving to Michigan State University, so the network's set to include institutions, more scholarly societies, um, and also to create so social science and science hubs. Um, so there's a lot to be excited about in the future, and um, I look forward to talking more in the Q&A. So thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. Moving on to our final case study, our last speaker is Bridget Schull, who's Director of Scholarly Communications Research and Development at Cambridge University Press. Thanks, Bridget. Thank you, Louise, and, and hi to everyone who's joined us at, at the webinar today. I'm here today to share the view from Cambridge University Press in regards to how collaboration is evolving in the early research space, picking up on some of the themes that, that Anne just made points on. Uh, and I'm going to draw on the insights from market research that we've done to support the development of our open research platform, Cambridge Open Engage. So before I get into that detail, I just want to make it clear what Cambridge Open Engage is. So if you go to the next slide, and then the next slide. At its heart, the platform hosts early research outputs, such as preprints, conference posters, and presentations, as well as other types of open content and gray literature. Cambridge Open Engage is primarily aimed for the research community, but it is accessible to all audiences because none of the content is behind a paywall and it's free for authors to upload. Next slide, please. We also host content uploaded directly to, to Cambridge Open Engage by individual users, as well as content through partner sites across multiple disciplines. So on this slide, you can see the one of our partners, the American Political Science Association, which Dr. Britting referenced, uh, AFSA Preprints. They launched their preprint server with us a little over a year ago. And we support partners as well with hosting functionality for individual events, such as conferences or symposium. Next slide. With the platform, we're aiming to support more openness across the research lifecycle and have a place for experimentation in open research. So we chose to take the approach of supporting external organizations as well as offering a direct service to researchers because we thought that there could be opportunities in how we connect users across and between both services. And in conducting market and user research to support this direction, there was a clear need to extend the benefits of collaboration in early research, uh, especially the kinds of things that happen in person at specific venues like conferences, the, the connective tissue then in between those types of events. Next slide. So that would be valuable to the range of audience members that we have here today to surface some of the insights that come from the research we've done, as well as some of the indicators of the case for collaboration from other types of research. Next slide. Our research showed us that many scholars are still using informal tools around collaboration. We found that discussing research findings with peers at a conference comes as a priority for researchers, and 63% of those surveyed in, in one of our uh, pieces of market research want to collaborate more. But early research, early career researchers were 20% less likely than senior academics to have funding or resources for conference attendance. The, pr the pressure to find a complement to the conference model has been building for years, partly because access to conference travel budgets vary widely depending on how well funded an institution is or where an academic is based in the world. Obviously, though, the pandemic has only made it more critical that we find new ways to provide feedback, build networks, and workshop research findings in advance of publication. In the scholarly communications ecosystem, we're also seeing thunder calls for more open forms of publication. 
critiques of traditional publishing venues, venues from scholar-led initiatives, and the rapid and fairly massive growth of the sharing of preprints and, and other early research outputs. Interdisciplinary research especially is inherently collaborative, and this kind of research is getting more funding as a direct proportion. Supporting collaboration through digital tools, though, isn't synonymous with openness, of course, but at Cambridge, we're pursuing this under the banner of openness because we believe that most kinds of collaboration are more valuable when they're visible to other researchers. Next slide, please. We've taken this position in part because that market research that we've done over the past couple of years has demonstrated that a majority of academics believe that collaboration is seen to improve quality of research, as well as the fact that they also, a majority of researchers that we surveyed saw that open research was a means to increase the quality of research, not just the, a way to increase speed. So the research has been really helpful for us in highlighting that feedback, advice, and validation are key for researchers who are new to interdisciplinary work or who are working alone. Other pieces of targeted research we've done have also highlighted this approach, but from a different direction. For example, when a group of over 200 researchers working across disciplines in climate change were asked what a quote, effective community of climate change researchers would look like. Two of the key themes were the importance of a global community with a shared common goal, as well as supporting multiple content types on a shared platform. Next slide, please. Of course, there are multiple barriers to collaboration, whether in person or digitally, and this slide shows what our research respondents viewed as some of the biggest challenges, which you've heard echoed in some of the other presentations today as well. So Cambridge University Press works across disciplines, and so we know that we need to develop Cambridge Open Engage in such a way that it takes into account the very different opinions about preprints as a form of currency in the early research space. For example, a piece of research that we did very recently over the summer with over a thousand humanities and social science scholars gave us the data point of 80% of respondents had published or contributed to peer-reviewed journal articles, followed by 69% publishing books or book chapters with only 9% having shared preprints. So there's still an evolution here, but that doesn't mean that that, that, that sharing of early research isn't happening. Uh, and Anne touched on this a bit of, of what that looks like in the humanities, but it's, it's really a rich space. It just looks, looks potentially different than it does in STM. Next slide, please. So for, um, you know, I referenced earlier that we see benefits to users of Engage coming from the connections that we can make between those partner sites and the content that we have submitted directly to the Engage repository. So we would like to create another layer of UI, of user interface that we're calling communities. And the UI here will bring together the broad community of researchers working in interdisciplinary fields with the goal to solve pain points around doing and producing interdisciplinary research. We'll also continue to our, expand our support of preprints and other kinds of early research content. Uh, and so we want to do that by developing functionality for other kinds of interactions that support collaboration, which could range from enabling users to get feedback on things like research design, so kind of before a, a preprint itself would be an output, um, to starting discussion threads either around content or around research topics. So we're using a panel of 200 plus researchers and best practices from the field of interaction design to be able to ideate what kinds of interactions we should prioritize in our development. So we're trying to design Cambridge Open Engage with the research community directly. So I'll wrap up with just sharing a view into the personas that we use to help us design our development and some of the user stories that we're, we're helping to focus on and what kind of interactions would be useful on the platform. On the next slide, please. So uh, I'll share this. Um, these are the personas that we use to, to kind of give us a sense of of who we're designing for. And so for us, it's um, it's helpful to think about some of the user stories. So things like arranging from, I wanna find collaborators in my field from other institutions so that I can discuss perspectives and share new insights, to being able to establish a research, an early research idea um, to, to help prevent scooping, to being able to get feedback on initial stages of research design and help connect with an, an audience and build profile early on. Uh, and I referenced that panel of researchers that we're using. So for those of you who are joining us, if you'd like to get involved, that, that's something that you could absolutely do. And, and we'd love to hear from you. And I'd be happy to, to have an email if that's something that you want to get involved in. So my email is on this next slide, but I'll hand it back to Louise for the, the Q&A portion. Thanks very much, Bridget. 
we're going to bring back all of the the panel now so that we can have um, some discussion around the themes that have emerged through the the presentations of the various case studies so let's dive in with um, a general question that i think will be relevant for, for all of our speakers um, what initiatives are emerging within your communities to ease the challenges associated with information overload with regards to early open research and preprints in particular um, and also with identifying trusted content so i don't know who would like to pick up on that first i nominate jessica on the trusted content <laughs> oh, well, I was going to nominate you, Alex, because I think, uh, anyway, but, but I, I can definitely speak to a few of the initiatives that are uh, coming out in uh, relation to COVID-19 preprints in particular. I think there is a special need for community feedback and review um, of these preprints in a manner um, that uh, is as rapid as possible. So um, I think that the uh, I, I think that in terms of information overload, this is of course a problem um, that has been affecting any revolution in the way that we share uh, content with one another. And so I think the integration of preprints into existing search tools is one way that um, they can become more comprehensible as a resource. But because preprints lack um, a lot of the assumptions that we make about journal articles based upon where they're published and they, uh, there's no assurance that they've been through a peer review process. Um, I think it's very valuable that there are initiatives, um, you know, uh, like those we've been talking about on this panel. Um, but there have been some very organized efforts, especially for the COVID-19 preprints from uh, groups such as uh, the Mount Sinai Immunology Review Program which has very systematically gone through all COVID-19 relevant preprints um, that are uh, of interest to immunologists and has actually written detailed reviews on them that get posted in the comment section of BioArchive. Um, there's another project from the Knowledge Features Group and the MIT Press called um, Rapid Reviews COVID-19. Um, but you know, broadly speaking, I think that there's a lot of uh, the, the management of this information overload, at least from what I see in biomedical sciences is happening um, on Twitter. So many researchers, and certainly when I was a postdoc, this is how I found out about preprints, uh, just are looking at what people are talking about, uh, people that you know. And of course, this creates other problems in the sense that it perpetuates filter bubbles. It doesn't highlight preprints from authors that are perhaps unknown. And so again, going back to this perspective of um, making attention more equitable, we need to keep that in mind as we're designing uh, additional curation tools. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else like to add to that before we move on? Okay. Um, next question, how has the reduction in face-to-face -face contact for researchers impacted workflows and opportunities for collaboration within your community? Obviously, you've covered some of these, but it would be great to hear if there are other examples um, that you're seeing in, in your area or elsewhere, more broadly with, across scholarly communications. There's one in particular that, I, that caught my eye, um, I thought was particularly interesting. This came, this was initiated by the Wisconsin National Primate Research Center, and they set up a Slack channel called the, the Wuhan Clan Slack channel. And that was really set up to try and connect PIs internationally to get them talking about preprints and new diseases, and just trying to foster that quick um, collaboration. And also as that sort of filter for, you know, this great volume of, of preprints that are coming out um, this year in particular. Um, but are, are there are other examples that, that you guys are hearing about or seeing? Not necessarily uh, tied to the, the, the current global situation, but uh, there have been a number of, of instances where collaboration specifically were spawned by discovery through preprints. And so okay. you, you have this situation where the earlier you are sharing your information, uh, sort of zoom out more and include things like pre-registration of, of a research process. Um, mm -hmm. 
it allows you to sort of have that initial stake in the ground, but it also uh, accelerates the the possibility that somebody else in the world who is working on a similar problem can see that pre-registration and say, hey, we're working on the same problem, should we collaborate on it? And so there, there's a number of, of anecdotal uh, instances of this right now. I don't know that it's been studied uh, in depth, but I think that's that's one of the, the things that we should recognize and, uh, and sort of, uh, 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 promote within the, the preprint ecosystem is that level of collaboration. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah. At Cambridge, we what we saw um, as far as more recent forms of collaboration and, and a response to the pandemic specifically was the need to, to be able to support events. So that wasn't something that was previously on the roadmap for Cambridge Open Engage. Uh, but we did develop functionality around that and, and APSA has made good use of that as they were, were trying to adapt like so many other organizations to not having those in-person events. And for them to have that integrated to the preprint piece, to the repository piece was really valuable. Uh, but it also helped us to serve the scholarly communications community. Cambridge was set to host UP Redux, a, a live in-person event. And uh, thankfully we're able to kind of scramble to use Engage to be able to, to host that conference. So. We have all of the materials from that event now on Cambridge Open Engage, but that was something that that had to be done a, a kind of on the the cut off the cuff and in an agile way because of the the changing circumstances. But but we have seen that that's really helped to support collaboration. Yeah, I think as you say, it's sort of that perfect fit around events, but also more journal club type activities. Um, so it would be interesting to see sort of where that goes in the future. Yeah, I think one very Oh, um, I was just going to say, I think similarly, we've seen obviously an increase in the importance of supporting like asynchronous discussion during virtual events. Um, also, teaching materials and kind of helping helping people who are pivoting to teaching remotely has been um, part of our focus. And then in the humanities, especially like print materials are so important and people might not have access to their libraries or their campus offices or you know, if they're getting mail to their campus office and increasingly we've seen more more and more importance on uh, digitally available and openly available resources. I suppose the other question is how much sort of collaboration or discussion is sort of happening offline or through more traditional means, whether that's through email or private message through Twitter that's still not being as you know transparent for whatever reason. I suppose that's going to vary a lot discipline to discipline, but it feels as though there's still that element sort of happening that we can't quantify. Um, okay, we have a very specific question for Anne. Um, is MLA Commons a scholarship open to the STM fields too? Um, so MLA Commons is uh, specific to MLA members, and then it's part of a broader network, Humanities Commons, that's open to anyone to join. And the focus is on humanities fields, but we haven't like policed who is within. If people have humanistic interests or part, like engaged in humanistic social sciences or have overlaps, intersections with um, humanities, anyone is um, welcome to join. There's no requirement for any kind of affiliation or membership in a scholarly society. And there will be um, in the future uh, additional hub, like parallel to humanities commons for the sciences. So that's to come. Um, this is a sort of general question around experiences of early research being picked up in the media and obviously with um, research being open and accessible to all um, there's that question of scrutiny and also sort of you know there's been discussion around um, you know perhaps speculative papers that have fueled conspiracy theories in the media so um, it'd be interesting to know whether the panels had any experience of that so far. So uh, ASAP Bio, we just started a project called Preprints in the Public Eye to address some of these concerns. Um, and uh, I, this project has multiple components. One is um, seeing if there's any way that we can improve the labeling of preprints so that it's more clear uh, to readers. Uh, for example, a lot of preprint labels use terms like peer review and you know, uh, is it clear to everyone who comes to a preprint server how that manuscript falls in the entire um, uh, process of scholarly publishing? 
Second, I think that there is a um, important question as to how researchers and institutions are communicating uh, on social media and um, and also how journalists, I mean, do they have the resources that are needed to help them communicate the nature of preprints under the tight deadlines? But I think that the, um, the problem that you're raising, um, which is really about potentially the use of preprints for um, disinformation maybe, or for, um, for you know, potential misinformation, um, or the uh, interpretation of preprints in a way that either the authors did perhaps did intend or maybe didn't intend. Um, I think uh, really the only, um, I think, solid remedy for this, I believe, is commenting and review on preprints from experts in the community. So there's a very well-known preprint uh, suggesting similarity to HIV, but that was withdrawn within only 48 hours after dozens of community members commented on it. So I think that is the power of preprints to rapidly respond to community feedback and correct uh, potential misinterpretations. So I do think that robust commentary is necessary. I completely agree with Jessica. We, we actually added commenting functionality uh, over the, the summer for partly for that that very reason was to be able to have a better kind of filtering mechanism. Uh, I mean, outside of the, the context of, you know, some of these examples that have had a lot of attention, that filtering process is also the power of the preprints. And as far as the, the positive too, you know, it's, it's a way for people to improve their paper before they submit it for peer review or before they publish it. But it does really help in these cases. Uh, and for, for us, I know, um, we we had specifically designed the moderation process. It was pre-COVID, uh, so we didn't know that we were going to need it in quite the same way. But but to really make sure that that we were doing our due diligence. Um, so it's not a peer review process, but it is something that we designed with academics at the university in order to to make sure that what was there was was valid scholarly research um, and to to look at some of the possible you know conflict of interest or ethical challenges that could come up. Um, something that we also have, have made changes to in light of more recent events is, as Jessica said, is around that signposting of, of how we designate that the content is, is not final, is not peer reviewed, and we'll, we'll probably continue to make changes based on feedback that we get from users and, and outcomes, like some of the initiatives that Jessica just described and, and other things happening. So it, it is an area that I think we all have a responsibility to, to kind of keep on top of. Absolutely. Yeah. But but also in in addition to that the you know the issue with how uh, the non researcher audience interprets research is not isolated to preprints uh, and it's it's not isolated to maybe questionable research the same thing happens uh, to peer reviewed research where it's misinterpreted or or reconveyed and so I think that's just a uh, it's, it's a realization that the research community needs to sort of take into account where typically researchers are writing to themselves as an audience and sort of understanding how the, um, the lay audience uh, may be interpreting it differently or maybe having it reinterpreted for them differently. Ongoing mm -hmm. issue. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, we're fast coming up to the end of the session, and I, I think it would be nice if we could just finish up with some sort of quick fire comments on predictions for the early research space in the next five years. So um, just to put everyone on the spot, perhaps Bridget, would you be happy to give your sort of quick fire answer to that before we wrap up? Uh, I mean, one of the, the biggest things I think is one of your questions that you highlighted earlier is, is ways to help curate the content and, and ways to help kind of make this information overload accessible or more customizable. I think it's more about that personalization and I think we'll see more tools and services helping with that in the future. Thank you. Anne, what are your sort of thoughts for the future in this space? Um, yeah, I think thinking about um, some of the how to addressing some of the like vulnerability vulnerabilities and underrepresentation among um, people who are uh, participating. I think like labor issues and sort of contingency are big issues that um, will need to be sort of taken into account as we're thinking about directions for um, for our work. So those are those are my initial thoughts. Such an important area. Yeah. Jessica. 
So um, with some co-authors, we recently did an analysis of COVID-19 preprints and found that they're about half of the length in terms of the words and contain fewer figures and, re and references. And I think that this represents the future of preprinting. Um, that a individual, they also also go through more versions than on COVID preprints. So the idea that a researcher could upload a work in progress, um, receive community feedback perhaps earlier than journal submission, um, and then continue to revise it and uh, build on that work over time. So I hope that we see more use of preprints as a way to convey research that is really in progress rather than uh, closer to the point of journal submission. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting area because it sort of opens up those questions around infrastructure process and how all the sort of plumbing supports that. Um, Alex, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I think along the, the, the same lines as what Jessica just said, um, the, uh, I, I think we will continue to see um, additional experiments happening with what actually gets uh, uh, posted as a preprint. So negative results, uh, smaller snippets, uh, something that starts to address some of the information overload and sort of thinking about how can I get my my uh, my hypothesis out there? How can I get my research out there? But how can I also get it out there in a way that makes it more amenable to being um, uh, aggregated together? So we're not just thinking about preprints as a paper that a human is going to read, but we're thinking about it as contributing to this sort of growing knowledge base of, of research information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And always really tough to go last with this sort of question, but Professor Brunning, <laughs> what would you like to add to that? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, you know, for me, I've just been uh, recently um, exposed to preprints, and uh, after the panel today, I see way more possibilities um, for this particular space than, than I actually thought about before. Uh, so I'm really glad to have had the opportunity to uh, to learn uh, from everybody on the panel, um, it's it's really I think an exciting new development to uh, communicate with other scholars. Yeah. That's great. So that brings us to the end of our time. So I'd like to say um, a huge thank you to our panelists. Also, thank you very much to the attendees for joining us today. And a final thank you to the Cambridge University team who have organized the technology and kept everything running. So thanks very much, everyone, and information on the recording and uh, any questions we didn't get to to follow. So thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.